Bless thou, O King of Kings, the city of New York. Cause the friends there to be kind to one another, purify their souls and make their hearts to be free and detached. Illumine the world of their consciousness, exhilarate their spirits and bestow a celestial power and confirmation upon them. Establish their heavenly realm so that the city of Baha may prosper and New York be, favor be favored with the blessings from the Apa kingdom that this region may become like the all highest paradise, may develop into a vineyard of God and transformed into a heavenly orchard and a spiritual rose garden, Abdul Baha. Wanna read a prayer, Grandma? Tell the God they don't mind if I read. Is it okay if my grandma reads a prayer in Farsi? Of course. Hmm? Yeah, it's fine, go right ahead. Okay. Okay, I'm not going to go too long because uh, you don't speak Farsi, so it's going to be very boring for you. No, I understand. don't say that. that <laughs> ای کریس از مطلعه منور کنم و از مشرق قنایت ثروت حقیقی بر توی بخشنده و توانا سام بها را Okay, uh, welcome everyone. Um, I'd like to welcome back uh, Dr. Hussein Adia, and uh, he's going to present his talk, uh, Tahere, Forerunner of Liberation and Education of Women in Iran. Um, Dr. Adia was born and raised in Nariz, Iran. He's a sixth generation Baha'i. His ancestors figured among the first in Nariz to accept the Babi and later Baha'i faith. Hussein immigrated to the United States as a young man of 17. Like many immigrants seeking a better life in America, he worked and attended college in the New York City area. Hussein eventually completed a master's degree in European intellectual history and a doctorate in education from the University of Massachusetts. Dr. Adi is the author of many books, including The Calling, Tahereh of Persia and Her American Contemporaries, and Foreigner from Iranian Village to New York City. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to welcome Dr. Adia. Thank you, Anne. Uh, it's so wonderful to see uh, uh, all of you. Actually, many of you uh, remind me of my younger days. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, some of the faces I see, I remember, um, maybe I have seen them 40, 50 years ago. Uh, and uh, I'm so glad you are still alive and uh, get the chance to Zoom each other. Uh, they, uh, this is really a, a, a sneak preview of a, a presentation that I'm supposed to make uh, I think it's the next weekend, yeah, October 17. Uh, there is a, a large gathering that takes place uh, in Canada uh, this year. Well, it's, it's going to be a virtual, but uh, it's based in Canada right now, uh, called the World Parliament of Religion. And uh, uh, I, I, I'm one of the speakers uh, uh, for that, in that parliament. And uh, I don't know why they selected me. Uh, and there are so many wonderful uh, uh, souls who can do a better job on the subject. But somehow, I guess, uh, they found me available and I'd be there. Uh, actually, the, the other speakers are way above my head. Uh, you're going to meet uh, Dalai Lama as a speaker and uh, all kind of former UN Secretary, Dr. Goodell, and a bunch of other quite a Nobel Prize winner, Shirin, uh, uh, what's her last name? Abadi. Abadi, the, the, the one who got the Nobel Prize for peace a few years ago. So uh, uh, it, the only thing is that it's, it's costly. If you want to come and listen to them, you have to register. 
So I think you're lucky you're here tonight at least. Uh, you can listen to me so you don't have to uh, come to the whole session and spend, um, I think it's a $100 registration fee to, to join and, and listen to the presentation. Uh, the subject uh, that I guess appealed to them and is uh, very close to my heart is the subject of Tahereh and uh, uh, her influence and her uh, uh, effect on the progress and the liberation of the woman of Persia, especially when it time come to uh, internal education, but I will concentrate more farther. Uh, over a thousand books and article has been written about Tahereh and uh, uh, such an extensive research has been done. So this, uh, uh, this is the, just my corner of contribution that I can make and I figure out is a significant part. You know, the, the time that Tahere appeared in Persia, uh, a family or a dynasty was ruling Persia called Ajar dynasty. Uh, Ajar dynasty, there were a, a group of kings who they were corrupt, they were uh, weak, they were incompetent, unfortunately, and uh, the whole country as often referred to by Baha'u'llah, Abdul Baha and Shoghi Effendi was uh, in the low ebb of civilization and progress. And it's amazing that the land, uh, th these figures like somebody like Abdul Baha appear that is really the blessing for that land. Uh, education in, the, in Persia during this family, the Bajar dynasty, was limited to very a small number of people who attend often religious school. You know, nobody want to become a chemist or a physicist or a doctor or a, you know, a lawyer or whatsoever. The, the, the thing that was available to study under Ayatollah and, and under some mullah to become mullah yourself. This was the uh, extent of the available education in those days. Uh, and it was only available to a limited number of people. And of course, was only available to men. Uh, nine, I would say, I read someplace 95%, but I would even uh, say that maybe 99% of the population of that country during that period, they were illiterate. The one who could read or write their uh, religious leaders, mullahs, who uh, they go to school for 20, 25 years to become a mujtahid. So, so they can issue a fatwa or then can issue a, a statement and a decision on some religious issues. The, let me tell you that the Islamic uh, tradition, especially in Shia sect, is that you have a two group of people. You have a mujtahid, the learned one, the one who do the ishtahad, and you have the muqallid, the one who follow. So the mujtahid is the one who supposing he knows everything, all knowing, all wise. And then rest of the population, 80, 90, 95% are the follower of those people. So this was the extent of education in, in that period. And what they would study often in school or they were, there, they were there was either Quran, there were some poetry, and there were occasionally, they would study some logic and some uh, philosophy. Now, uh, in this environment, in this circumstance, uh, in the city of Qazvin, a young woman uh, was born uh, at the the, is the subject of our presentation tonight. Uh, her name was Tahere. Uh, she was from a very interesting family uh, because uh, through her mother and her grandmother, these were very learned women of Persia at the time. And uh, they have done some study and some research on the family of Tahere by Mujar Momin, a great Baha'i scholar that traced the family of Tahara to a number of centuries. And she, he emphasized that actually her mother's sides, her mother, grandmother, and other, they were much more significant figure 
in the country than her father's side. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, her father especially was a kind of forward looking uh, Ayatollah or Mullah because he, he even opened a school and uh, in the Qazvin, city of Qazvin, that would allow some woman to attend the school. And his wife, or Tahara's mother, was one of the teachers in that school. So the reason I'm saying that the Tahara came from an environment of learning, of education, of books. Uh, there are some pictures I have seen uh, of a library that was in their house that contained hundreds of books. Uh, and that was also very unusual for a Persian family at the time. The biggest regret of Tahara's father was that this person is a girl. And often he would say how he wished that the Tahara was a boy. And he said, if he was a boy, he would surpass all, all my other children and all the, the contemporaries of her age and too bad. But then at the same time, of course, he loves her and he helped her to get as much education and learning as possible. Uh, the, father, the old man had, the, I think, number of wives, so I don't know how many, but uh, we do know that Tahara had six, seven six sisters, and uh, she, she had uh, seven, eight brothers and all that. It was very quite usual for the time, uh, at that time. So uh, this young girl uh, was named Fateme when she was born, but uh, they never used that word Fateme because her grandmother was also named Fateme. And they thought it's a sort of a not respectful to call the little kid Fati, Fati, Fatime when the grandmother is also alive. So they refer to her sometimes as Zarri Taj, meaning the golden hair or uh, cr golden crown. And I got the feeling that the, she, as a child, she might have a blonde hair or golden hair because Azwin is in the area or influenced by the Turks. And there are lots of Turkish uh, women and men who are kind of blonde and have the, the not the blackish hair hair things. So that one, that was one of her titles, Zardin Taj. She was also, you know, later on we do know that she was named Tahere first by Bob the Qaim uh, or twelve Imam, and later on the title of Tahere was confirmed by Baha'u'llah in the Badash Conference. And another title that she got, which uh, is well known among the Baha'is and non-Baha'is in the East, is Porratul Ain. How did she get this title is interesting too. Uh, there was a, a new and very successful movement in Islam in 19th century called Sheikh Yeh, that was formed by a man called Sheikh Ahmad Ahsa'i, uh, quite the learned scholars and which came up with this unusual uh, approach to some of the Islamic theology, which is very complicated uh, and it's not, a, it's not the right place to discuss that. So Tahere uh, became attracted to this school of thought. And then Sheikh Ahmad Ahsai, the founder of the movement died, a man by the name Sayyid Kazem Bashti. And Tahere began to correspond with Sayyid Kazem and defend the principle of Sheikh movement. And she was such an eloquent writer that when Sayyid Qasim received her uh, essays and her statement, he referred to her as Oratul Ain, the solace of my eyes, so, which is a quite a beautiful uh, title to be given to her. This title of Oratul Ain stayed with her because later on after she became Bobby, there was so much to say about this woman. Uh, there was a, a new school started. There were a whole bunch of people who actually began to follow Tahere as a manifestation herself. So those were referred to as Porratiye. These were the people who really believe that Tahere is an unusual and significant figure and uh, it's due for respect and for showing love and all that. They said it was in the city of Karbala the, her follower, they go sh shopping in the morning and then they bring the food to her present so she could gaze on them and purify them. Like a, a rabbi who does the kosher 
or halal in Islam. So this, this was how they love her and they resect her. And quite a number of those people, often when she would move from one place to other place, hundreds of them would follow her on foot or on horse from place to place. I'm getting away from my main topic uh, that the, I was trying to say that the, her education and her upbringing was an, uh, conducive to propagating and to preaching that education is a necessary uh, element for progress of society and for elevation of a station of woman. In the writing of Tahereh, and I'm familiar with her writing because actually her writing is much more uh, deep and pronounced than her poetry. Uh, she never directly talked necessarily about equality of man and woman. Because we often, when we talk about Tahere, we, we refer to her as a forerunner of liberation of woman. I love that title. But the thing is that the way she lived and the way she conduct herself and the, the set of belief that he followed, the teaching of Bao, was all along the line of liberated woman and educated woman. So this combination was very unusual. It was so unusual that the, after she became a little older and she realized that she has married this horrible cousin of hers, Muhammad, she decided to dump him because he was no good and, uh, and leave Qazvin and with her sister and a few others to go to Karbala to meet Sayyid Qazim, the head of the uh, Sheikhi movement. Unfortunately, she arrived 10 days late uh, to meet him because he died 10 days earlier. And uh, she was welcome to the house of Sayyid Qazim and Sayyid Qazim's wife invited her to conduct the classes and lectures of Sayyid Qazim. This is quite also unusual. You know, when, when I see a classes of Sayyid Qazim, you have to remember that there were hundreds of men, mostly men, almost all men, who years and years have studied theology of Islam, Quran, poetry, logic, Greek, Greek uh, stuff, and all of a sudden to ask a young woman to continue lecturing them. And most of this lecture was taking place from behind the curtain that because they, she was not supposed to show her face. And uh, this, this, her theology and her presentation and her talk create a great deal of upheaval in the city of Karbala. So of course, as you know, that she was forced to, to leave and she uh, went to Baghdad and from Baghdad, she returned to Qazvin. I'm not going to repeat the whole story of her life. In Qazvin, uh, her uncle was killed. She was accused of being involved in killing him. She escaped Qazvin with the help of Janab Baha or later on known as Baha'u'llah. She went to Tehran and then she attended the Badash conference and it was there, she also again break the taboo and tradition of the past by removing her veil and openly declaring that the new day is around the corner. Uh, Tahereh's poetry is well known in the East. It is in Persian, it's been translated to the main language. She is extremely popular in India. She is popular in Pakistan. I even understand in Pakistan, they have a one day a year, they call it Tahereh's holiday. So that day is as a response or as a respect for the present of Tahereh. Uh, a man, a great figure in, uh, in Pakistan and India by the name Iqbal, uh, you may have heard his name, he's a great Indian poet himself. And he got the Nobel Prize for poetry. He, uh, he was in love with Tahereh's writing and Tahereh's poetry. And, he admiration for Tahereh actually led to the spread of the name of Tahereh and her poetry in India. Now, of course, we do know that Professor Brown of Cambridge University, Lord Curzon, and many others who were the leading figure of the contemporary time that she was living, they all, they, uh, they talk about her and they mention her life. Unfortunately, at age of 36, in the year 1852, because of her uh, revolutionary ideas, her radical views, and her idea of man and woman and education and liberation, 
Eventually, she was put to death. And uh, you know that the way they, they killed her, they took her scarf and they strangled her and they threw her in the well. And the rumors are that the last word that she was using at that occasion was, you may kill me, but you will not stop the emancipation and progress of women. Which, whether she had said that or not, but this is, has been said so often that I believe there must be some reason to, to use that in all. Now we're going to move forward 50 years and to talk about what happened then. In the year 1899, the Baha'is of Iran, in the memory of Tahere and in the memory in the, of others, and in following the teaching of Baha'u'llah, they decided to open a major Baha'i or school called Tarbiyat. Of course, of course it was not a Baha'i school, it was a school for everyone. It was well attended by many uh, young children of Tehran, uh, uh, children of the leading figure of Persia were attending, even the daughters of the Shah, Reza Shah, uh, uh, I think it was Ashraf and uh, who's the other one, Shams. The two of them attended that school. The last Shah of Iran, for, for a time being, he also attended this Tarbiyat school. It was a wonderful setup because, of course, they follow a national curriculum that has been established by the government. But there were other schools in the country. But then, on top of that, because it was sort of private school, they have added foreign languages, they added physical education, they added the uh, sanitation, and a few other things that was quite unusual for the time in Persia. So this was, of course, for the boys. In uh, 1911, the program was expanded and they opened simultaneously another school also called Tarbiyat, and this was for the girls. The main force behind the formation of this school was the man called Abdul Baha, who was quite anxious to see that the, a new generation of young Baha'is and other Persian to go to school and get fully educated and to be a contributed citizen to the country. Soon, there were almost 50 Baha'i schools open around the country. They opened a school in Hamadan, they opened a school in Kashan, in Yazd, in Isfahan, uh, of course in Tehran, uh, uh, else, uh, a number of other places. And then some of the leading scholars of the 20th century of Persia came from those schools. A man named Yarshater, who is considered the greatest Orientalist, Ehsan Yarshater, came from there. Or a man uh, uh, called, uh, what was the name? It was a famous architect, uh, architect. I don't remember his name right. Sehun. Sehun was a great architect and he was a student there. Another, another distinguished guy, Rasef, or Professor Hakim, Professor Ayadi. These were all the students that went to that school. And some women who also attended that school, um, um, this is Ayadi or Otsiye Ashraf and other. These were all involved in the school that was set up for the boys first and the girls first. I read some place, which unfortunately, we don't have much more information about that, that the first Baha'i school that opened in Persia, and I, I just all wanted to know that this school was opposed constantly by reactionary and by mullahs that they often issue a fatwa and they would close it or they would burn it down and all kind of tragic thing to close the school. I read someplace that in the year 1870, only 20 years after Tahara died, a man in Mazandara by the name, uh, what was his name? I think uh, Mullah Ali, yeah. Mullah Ali in 1870, along with his wife, Alevia Hanum, they opened a school, a high school, and they run it for 12 years with lots of opposition. Eventually, uh, they arrested him 
and they sent him to Tehran for doing what he was doing. And he was put to death in Tehran because of opening a school and Baha'i activity. This is amazing. The plight of the Baha'is in that country, even when they were doing the best for that land, was always condemned and always subject to persecution and attack. Uh, I should say a few words about the contribution of American women to the progress of the Baha'i education and Baha'i school in Persia. Abdul Baha was very anxious to bring about a support and a good relation between American Baha'i community and the Persian Baha'i community. And some of the leading figure that came from America to Persia at that time, and they contributed substantially to the faith and the, the school was woman named, they named Dr. Susan Moody was one of them, for example, who was a doctor, came to Iran, opened an office, helped, helped to help the school, the girls' the school, Tarbiyat, and eventually in 1934, she died. There are some pictures of the funeral for Susan Moody. Hundreds of people are attending her funeral because she was so much loved. There was another woman, uh, I think it was Elizabeth Stort, who came and she became a director of the Tarbiyat School for Girls. There was uh, Lillian Kappas, was another woman who came. And I think she was also a doctor. And unfortunately, I think she died after nine years in Persia from typhus. And uh, then, of course, a woman which I met personally before I came to America was a woman by the name Mrs. Sharp, who uh, was a young woman, came to Iran uh, uh, during Shoghi Afendi's time and uh, learned Persian and stayed there. And later on, when uh, Shoghi Afendi allowed the woman to be serving in national assemblies, she was a, a woman who was elected to National Special Assembly of Iran. And for many years, she was the secretary of the National Assembly of Iran. Tremendous help to progress of Tarbiyat School and the School for the Girls. Uh, was, well, I met her when, before I came to America. Actually, she was the one who wrote me, uh, wrote the letter of introduction. And God bless her. Uh, at the last moment when I was in her office, she gave me some phone numbers of, a, uh, for example, Dr. Giagari in Rome, uh, was a hand of a cause at the time, uh, and uh, said, well, go and visit him. And some Baha'is in London and things like this. So I have a phone number of Mrs. Shaw. There was an organization was formed called Persian American Educational Society. There was a nonprofit organization that was formed and great deal of financial contribution went to Iran uh, through this organization because American Baha'is, they really helped, especially even New York Baha'i community. I have some record of that, that they gave money and they contribute to this wonderful development of school. So the school were going on and they was doing amazing job uh, until 1934. See, let's call it bad luck or good luck. Next to the, the school for the boys, Tarbia, was the office of the king of Persia, Reza Shah. I don't know if he was king yet, but he was probably almost dead. So every morning when he goes to his office, he would hear the chanting and singing of Baha'i boys, uh, of Baha'i songs and other things. One day he goes to the office and he's a complete silence. So he asks, uh, uh, what's going on? Where, where is the music? Where is the singing? Where is the chanting? Oh, they tell them, your majesty, today is a Baha'i holiday. And on Baha'i holiday, they close the school. He said, what? They close the school at Baha'i? School was closed because he was missing listening to the chanting and singing that was taking place earlier. So this was really a, a, a shock and it was a, a really an attack on the welfare of society. But at this point, almost five, six, seven thousand students in Tehran. from the best education that they could get. 
and, and some of these students that they graduated from those schools, they, 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 they did some study on that area and they found out how they are quite far ahead of their own contemporary, the same class and all that. So this uh, school was closed and the uh, things got, the kids or Baha'i kids and other, they went to different schools and that life goes on until 1979. That I think most of you know what took place was uh, the Islamic revolution took place in Persia. And since then, as you all know, the suffering of a young people, boys and girls has started. They are deprived of getting education. They, can, they do not allow them to go to university even though they pass all kind of entrance exam. They try to do uh, some uh, long, uh, long distance learning to university. They try to stop that. But I think they, they, there are still uh, lessons are given by wonderful Baha'is around the world to some of these poor young girls and boys in Persia. And many of American universities have accepted their learning and they, their, their experience and they recognize it and they give them a degree. So this, uh, I all want to say that at least in my mind, uh, I contribute the formation and progress of Baha'i school, especially for girls, to a person named Tahare. Because often those families of Baha'is, when they were trying to encourage their daughter to get some education, they remind them of Tahare, and they even name their kids Tahare to just symbolize a learning, education, bravery, and sacrifice that that woman has done. So uh, God bless her soul. We all love her. I think I have a collection of pictures that uh, Anne has, and we just go over it quickly and uh, maybe we'll say a few words about them too. Well, this is a wonderful uh, 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 illustration that my good friend uh, from uh, what country she come from? Semin. Semin has done that. So supposed to be Tahere and her sisters and the father sitting at the corner and they are, they are reading books and they are studying. Next. This is the, uh, the library of uh, in Tahere's house that somebody has taken a picture many years ago. And uh, it's, I'm sure it contained Martha Ruth, I think you probably saw that and contain hundreds of books that Tahere had access to. Next. Oh, this is a uh, Tahere with the, uh, what's the story? Behind with her children in yeah. Karbala. Tahere with her children in Karbala. Uh, you know, she, the, her marriage was arranged uh, to her cousin and her cousin had to go to Karbala to pursue his education. And she went with him. And I think this, this painting represents that period. And uh, it was, I think, at that period, that place, that also she gathered lots of information and learning while, while she was in Karbala. Next. That's that. Tatiana, I cannot do this is Ivan Lloyd painting with uh, Tahare, with women. Oh yeah, this this Ivan Lloyd is a uh, painter, and we have lots of nice painting from her, uh, from him. And this again, Tahare probably her back is to us, is talking and educating some woman of her time. Next, next picture, huh? Beautiful. Thank you, Tatiana. Oh, this is another gathering. You see, when I say that Tahara's contribution, she was constantly at the middle of teaching and working with the, with the woman of Kazmin, the woman of Persia, and tried to bring them out of their misery and out of their life. You know, the woman, 19th century, 18th century in Persia, even these days, they were treating as a second or third class citizen. They hardly had any right. They, uh, and they were quite abused by their male contemporary. 
next. Well, this is what this is a, uh, uh, you know, Tahara from behind the uh, curtain, and I think it's supposed to be Bahid. Uh, remember, there is a famous story that Tahara was uh, sitting behind the curtain. She, she had Abdul Baha on her lap, and then Bahid, the great Colonel Bahid, the great scholar, Bobby scholars, was giving lecture and talk about the wonderful thing that the faith can do, this and that. Uh, so she started to raise her voice and he said, Yo, Bahi, uh, time for talk is over. Go and do something. And he was, you know, take some action. And they said, poor guy, probably he felt very bad to be lectured by a woman uh, to go and do something. And of course, at the time, he was considered one of the leading uh, mullahs of Persia. Next. This is the uh, sample of her handwriting, Tahara's handwriting. Uh, I'm familiar with her, her writing. Believe me, her writing is quite superior to her poetry. But somehow, I think everybody got excited about her poetry and they ignore some of her writing. But her writing is absolutely amazing. The way she defend the cause of the faith, Bobby faith, the way she shows her, it was a, of course, it's very mystical, uh, and some of some of the things that she writes, and I couldn't follow everything, but you could see the depth of her uh, mind and her desire and her love for the promise of it. Next. Oh, this is the beginning of. I we selected some picture to show the uh, uh, this the one at the middle. I think is Dr. Susan Moody, and and these are the all the students and, uh, and others who were part of the education of, in those days. Next. Again, Susan Moody. Uh, there is a woman I think is sitting there next to her, or maybe another one farther right, was Sia Ashraf. Uh, one of these days, I'm going to give a talk about her. She was a quite an unusual Persian woman that toward around 10th of a century, she came to America, she went to Columbia University, she got, I think, her PhD or something, it was quite unusual, and she went back to Iran and she started so many social economic uh, projects and uh, contributed tremendously to the welfare of the woman of Persia. Ashraf was her last name. Next. Okay, so can you imagine? This is a sweet American woman at the middle of hundreds of Persian Baha'i men. They all adore her. She was a good doctor, she was an educator. This is Susan Moody again, the head of the Tarbiat School for. These are some of the uh, boys and girls in the school. Are they all boys or girls too? Boys and girls. You see, this is unusual too. At that, at that time, there were hardly any mix up of the boys and girls in the same setting. And so only in the Baha'i school, a Baha'i gathering, you would see something like this, and that they could take in their picture that the girls are with the boys in there. And if I'm not mistaken, at the middle is Mr. Fulta. Yes, yeah, yes, Mr. Full Times. Yes. Yeah, on, the, on the second row from top, the third from left to yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. And, she, uh, and he was my teacher actually uh, later on. And a lovely, lovely man who became a hand of a cause and the services to my faith is exemplary. And he, for a while, he was the head of the Tarbiyat School for the Boy. And I remember, uh, what's his name? Uh, Ehsan Yarshater. Oh, I love all this man. I, had, I was quite fortunate to know all these people. Uh, Ehsan Yarshater, as I mentioned, was a great scholar. Uh, he's the one who uh, started the Encyclopedia Ironica, which is unbelievable collection of material. And he said that the, uh, Mr. Fulutan was the head of Talbiyat School, and Yarshater was a student there. So Yarshater's mother or uncle went to Mr. Fulutan and complained that a son, Yarshater, is reading too much uh, novel. 
instead of reading something serious, writing of our law, history, or Roman Empire, and this and that. So Mr. Fullerton called him to his office. And uh, he said, uh, son, I understand you're reading too many novels. And so, uh, Mr. Yatra just said, I got so scared, he's going to tell me to stop reading, and I have to listen to him. And uh, I said, yes, Mr. Fullerton. He said, hey, son, John, at least read some good novels. And he said, he never forget that, that they, they encourage him to do reading, but pick up the good novels. And he said, that was a good advice from Mr. Fulton. Oh, these are again collection of younger kids. Uh, yeah. Whoever took this picture should be blessed. We have such a collection of, of these unique people. These are, these, were, these are the flowers of Persia. Very true. Did they have a new uniform? They look like it seemed uniform. like they were all dressing white. Yeah. Next. What is that? Is another picture of girls and boys. That's amazing. This may be on the National Baha'i Center. It looks a little familiar. Yeah, mm. I think so. Look at how many they are. God bless them. Next. I guess that's Susan Wood again. Yes. Yeah. We are supporting her and supporting the school. These are all girls? Yes. Jeez, that's unbelievable. That's, isn't that wonderful? Yeah, these are all the girls who attended the girls Very school. young kids. Remember, Very this, young this, we are talking about 1911, 1913 or 14, all more than 100 years ago. And all of them probably know they are in Abba Kingdom. At least I hope so. Okay, next. Those are the older older kids. Students. Yeah, these, these are must be. Or what what they would do often, they would start the school on the elementary level, and they gradually, when the kids grow up, they open the high school for them. Oh, I should say this: that my mother-in-law, uh, Tahara's mother. Uh, was one of the students who attended uh, school in Yazd. And she was the first, one of the first women who received the certificate when she finished the sixth grade of the school. And then from Yazd, she returned back to Neri's, her hometown. And she was considered a novelty. She was considered a great educator because she had the sixth, degree, sixth grade certificate. And then she became to teach the other girls in town. So it's, it's, it's lead one to, one to other. Yeah. Next picture. Oh, this, this, I like this book. Uh, a good friend of mine, Bahia Nakhchabani, who has written a book called uh, The Woman Who Read Too Much. It's a very popular book about the life of Tahrir. Uh, it's a story in the base. It's, it's not quite- It's uh, a novel. It's a novel. And the book is considered one of the best book written by a Persian English speaking writer, uh, contemporary, Bahia Nakhchabali. And we translated, originally was translated, originally was written in French, but is available in English and many other languages. Mm. And this is our book, Valerie Chapman and me. Uh, we, are, we are publishing a new edition and we are changing the front of the book, the book called Calling. Save your money, buy a copy, and you'll learn more about Tahrir. And American contemporary. And American contemporary. That was, I think, it's very unusual approach because the, 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 the trust of our book, me and Hillary, is that at the same time that Tahrir was making her call in Persia, there were some women in America, like a Sojourner Truth, like, a, a, founder of the Christian Science Church, like uh, many others who were influenced by the spirit of the age. And they were doing the same thing in America and Europe that Tahir was doing in the East. Next, I think it's Mitch. Is there any more? No, this is the last one. Thank you, Mitch. I think that's the last one. Thank you, Anne. God bless America. Now, if you have any, ask me some question. 
So uh, I, I take some break while you're asking questions. Does anyone have any questions? You can also um, write it in the chat if uh, we don't want to uh, say it out loud. Uh, we have one. Um, what is the significance of the locations for the schools? Sorry, let's just. So what are the significance of the location of the school? Significant of the schools? Of the locations of the schools. The biggest cities, probably. No, the, most, uh, most is. Uh, or bigger for high community. No, uh, they have, I, I have a feeling that the school would open in the communities which they already have a larger number of Baha'is to support it uh, numerically and financially. Uh, uh, they started the very first one in Tehran and then. Uh, in Hamadan and in Kashan, these were the two cities that the most the Jewish Baha'i came from there. And, and the school for the for them was also very popular in Hamadan Kashan. And of course, the, in Yazd was such a large Baha'i community. And the, the originally was Babi and Baha'i community. Uh, in Isfahan, they had the, they had the schools uh, for them uh, also. Uh, they would open the school, and unfortunately, as I mentioned, the local mullah would issue a fatwa and force them to close, and they close for a while, then they have to open again. So this was an unfortunate struggle that was going on until 1934, which they closed the school permanently. This is not to say that there was no other education was going on in the country. There were other schools was running by the government and others, but the it's a significant contribution that Baha'is have made to the education system. <coughs> Wonderful. Tatiana is going to go home soon. <laughs> um, yeah, I think one has a question. Oh, actually, I just wanted to share an um, interesting story. Um, so you had. Uh, you had mentioned that our that Tahara was in Hamadan. So actually, one of the stories is that goes that in Hamadan, um, my great grandparents, one of my great grandparents was a uh, was a uh, cantor in a Jewish synagogue. temple in a synagogue, and Tahara happened to be there at the synagogue and proclaiming the Baha'i faith, and that's how my family became Baha'i on my mother's father's side. I did. What happened? You have to tell us. Yeah, yes, you continue, Grandma. No, no. Then uh, uh, his father, I mean, great grandfather. What uh, was his name? Is it Abdul Baha? Esmailian. Esmailian, excellent. Okay. Uh, they changed their family name. Ah. In Hamadan uh, was very big thing. This Baha'i faith became very important. One of the most funniest story, and let me tell you, that you're going to love to hear this. Uh, his great grandfather, uh, because they were all Jewish, and uh, he want, he became Baha'i. So during fast, he would go and sleep and tell to mother, I'm not hungry. And midnight, he would take a piece of, you know, old piece of bread and open his past <laughs> for the next day. Now, then he went to bazaar. He went to bazaar, the same man. He went to bazaar. In the bazaar, the, everybody was cursing at him because he became Baha'i, you know, or he's Jewish, he became Baha'i even worse then. Uh, there was a man with a donkey standing there and selling stuff. Then uh, he came to his great grandfather and says, if this is the truth from God, I should die by tomorrow to, in the bazaar. That's a very funny story. Yeah. Then, uh, 
everybody says, why you want to die? Even the, his uh, great grandfather says, why you want? Tell the donkey you will die, not you. Why you? <laughs> Make him a sacrifice. <laughs> That's true. As a matter of fact, by the morning he died, had a heart attack, he died. Don't wish something. <laughs> Actually, let me tell you about Tahereh's, uh, uh, you know, Tahereh was forced to leave uh, Baghdad and leave Karbala and return back to Persia. And then in, in, the, in her traveling, he uh, stopped in Kermanshah. And after Kermanshah, she went to Hamadan. And Hamadan historically is very significant among the Jews because uh, it's a barrier place for, uh, what's the, that famous Jewish woman who saved uh, lots of Jews? Oh, Esther Mordechai. Uh, yeah, exactly. It was a barrier place of her. So there were a large number of Jewish community at that time in, in Hamadan. And they showed a great deal of affection and love for Tahereh. And she stayed there for a number of months. Martha Ruth extensively write about that period of Tahereh's life in Hamadan. It's so interesting, another story I read someplace that when Tahereh was in Baghdad, uh, in the house of the Mufti of Baghdad, Alusi, uh, she was giving a lecture. And at that time, Muhammad Shah, the king of Persia, was going to Karbala. And his doctor was a fellow by name Hakim. And Hakim attended this, uh, one of the lectures of Tahereh in Baghdad. And he was Jewish, of course. And he, later on, when he returned back to Iran, he started to inquire about his Bobby faith and all that. And he became Bobby and Baha'i. And he is the ancestor of Dr. Professor Hakim and, and all that. So lots of people like you, like Hakim, like your Charter, like uh, many other wonderful Baha'is in the faith, Azizis and other, they are really the product of uh, the seeds that was planted in Hamadan and in Kashan and in Baghdad by those Jewish rabbi and Jewish uh, citizens. God bless them all. Okay, next, any other question? Um, I think that's it, unless anyone else has a, a question. So, well, thank you so, so much. Uh, I learned a whole lot. I, uh, I Wonderful. I'm impressed. Yeah, the more, more I learn about her, the more I, I, I love to hear more about her. About her. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you. That she wants to learn more about the Jewish Baha'is. Yeah, well, uh, there is yeah. a book. There is a book written by Mehdad uh, Amonat, who is a cousin of Abbas Amonat, yeah. and it's uh, the whole book about the, uh, the the Jewish community or Jewish people who became Baha'i and why they became Baha'i, and mm -hmm. trace some of the family and all that. It's a quite a. Do you remember the name of the book? Yeah, yeah. It's it's just just the uh, Google Mehdad uh, Amonat. There is okay. quite a scholar. Yeah. And oh, he has written a, quite a scholarly book about the Jewish, the Baha'i Jews in, in the. Is it in Iran or in Persia at that time, or was it in English? English? The book is in English. No, uh, no, I mean, I mean the, the, the Jewish Baha'is, the Babis and Jewish Baha'is. Okay. Are they from Persia or uh, Turkey? That no, Jewish. The book is about the Jewish Baha'i community in Persia, in, in Iran. Persia. Okay. Yeah, that's right. My so father, speaking of Jews in Persia, they said this Jewish couple is a joke. This Jewish couple, they were visiting China and they were in a restaurant and they asked the waiter, is there, uh, is there any Jews in China? I said, uh, no, do, he said, do you have any? Uh, Jews in China. Jews, in, <laughs> Jews, he said, no, we don't have Jews. We, have, we don't have what part the joke was. <laughs> okay, I, I forget the joke. Doesn't matter. Maybe it doesn't mean I was also saying that. Okay, honey. And thank I you. I love you. 
I love you all. Thank you. Good night. It's always a pleasure to be with you. I learned so much. Thank you. you are, I love you. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. And thank you, Anne. Thank, thank you. you, everyone, for participating. Marlene, good to see you. Thank you. Thank Bye, you. Nice everyone. Good night. Okay. <laughs> thank good you night. for sharing. Bye. Stories. Wonderful.